Welcome back to my series on tone stacks. This is the fourth video. I'm going to discuss the Fender tone stack today. I need to introduce a couple more concepts to analyze this tone stack. So I'm going to touch on Ohm's acoustic law, Kirchhoff's laws, and also Themenon's theorem. I will also discuss the attenuation for the tone stack and the volume control just briefly. So in the first video, we talk, I talked about the math for series versus uh, parallel filters and the concepts from high to low pass filters. I applied that in the second video, which I also introduced the tilt control. Third video, I showed you how a bright cap method can be size a methodology and also because it is a parallel filter on the tone stack. In this video, I'm going to show you how to simplify filter configuration so you can do the, the analysis that needs to be done for whether it's this tone stack or any other filter that is as complex as this one. So hopefully by the end of this filter, see there bomb, I will have given you enough information between all four videos where you can analyze any configuration uh, of any tone stack there is out there. I'm not going to talk about Ohm's Law. You can download this. The relationship between voltage, current, uh, resistance, and power, Ohm's Law, I'm not going to touch about on today. But I am going to touch on this. Now, to expand on Joseph Fourier's work, Ohm said that a musical sound, as perceived by the ear, is a constituent of several other pure tones. That's almost right, but Hermann von Helmholtz said in order to make that more right, it gets down to that a pitch corresponding to a certain frequency can only be heard if the acoustic wave contains enough power to be heard. For example, if a pitch, a note, a pitch, has five constituent pure tones, and two of them have to be happen to be attenuated more than 20 dB, what you will hear is probably the three remaining which are not attenuated greatly and they will comprise the pitch which you will hear. Kirchhoff, two laws that we have to deal with there. One is, he says, in a network of conductors, the, at any particular node, the currents have to sum to net zero. What goes in must come out and the balance has to be zero. And then he says the voltages for a closed system, the directed sums need to add up to zero. Now directed sums is a geek math thing that says basically it's a bunch of connected branches. So generally what happens then is we see a tone stack as shown on the left on my whiteboard and we go, okay, I'm going to take the tone stack, I'm going to go right off into using Ohm's laws and Kirchhoff and what then and, then Helmholtz had said, we come over to the diagram on the right, mentally it's what's going on in our brain. We take the tones coming in and we go, what are the permutations, the, the crosstalk, the different attenuations, different phase angles, so on and so forth, and basically, you know, where are the voltages and currents through each of the branches that you see in the tone stack uh, circuit on the left? And that gets us right down into a mental block. And that's where a lot of people start a tone stack analysis, they look at that, they're thinking what's on the right, and they basically go, all's lost and there's no hope. Well, at the time of Kirchhoff, when he introduced his two basic laws and they were looking at different circuits, that's basically where they stopped, is how do you, for any moderately complex circuit, calculate the various currents and, and voltages in each of the legs? It gets complex. Well, along came a French uh, telegraph engineer by Leon Thévenon, came along, and he says it's easy. We can reduce the complex circuit into a much simpler equivalent circuit and then understand and calculate the current and voltages in that circuit. So basically he said this. If you take the circuit on the left, this pretend it's tone stack, if you will. There's four resistors in the capacitor. 
Well, to sit down and start looking at the current and, and voltages across each of the legs becomes a little bit complex. So using Thevenon's equivalent methodology, he then said, take a look at R1 and R3. They're in parallel. Combine them as in parallel, add in R2, which is in series, and then that is in series of C1. Easy. So now with that we can calculate the current through the circuit and the voltage drop across each of the resistors. We're going to take a step further. What you need to know for a tone stack is this. We can combine the resistor and C1 into an equivalent ohm, uh, impedance. That means at a particular frequency it will have a certain resistive value in ohms. Then we can do our work on the current and attenuation on that circuit. And that's what makes a tone stack analysis a little easier. We have to get the equivalent circuit down to this, or at least recognize the parts and pieces as such. So one more piece of information that we need to understand building on Kirchhoff's law is this. When a capacitor is at time zero, it acts as a dead short. In the DC world, it acts as a dead short. As time goes on and the capacitor charges up, then it acts as an open in the circuit. So what I've given you previously and this little concept here, then we allows us to then take circuits like this and take another quick look. Let me review this one more time. So basically we're saying that the circuit at the top at time zero, these capacitors at time zero act as shorts. Therefore, there's a short going around R1 and R2, giving us a circuit down here at the bottom, R3. Easy enough to calculate the current and the voltage drop in that circuit. Now then, at time infinity, or sometime after time zero, when the capacitors charge up, they act as opens. So basically R2 drops out, we're left with R1 and R3, and then Kirchhoff's law says that the voltage drop across R1 is a ratio of the voltage uh, supply times the ratio of R1 over the sum of the resistors, R1 plus R3. Voltage drop across R2. 3 is R3 over the sum of R1 plus R3 times the voltage, or the total voltage drop from uh, input to output is voltage drop across R1 and R3. We need to know this sort of thing, when we, especially when we start looking at evaluating the attenuation control for the tone stack. Now then, let's move off into the Venter tone stack itself. Now then, for nomenclature purposes. Why I refer to R is a resistor. RT means a resistor related to the treble. RB, resistor for the base. RN, resistor to mid. RTA means the resistive value of the treble resistor from the wiper to the top of the pot. RTB means from the wiper to the bottom of the potentiometer. That's just my nomenclature that I use throughout my video series. Now then, at T0, again, all the capacitors are shorted out, and because current goes through the path of least resistance, R4 actually is ignored. It is, whether it's 100,000 or, or whatever, is ignored because it's infinitely harder to go pass current through that resistor than, resistor than it is to go through a short piece of wire. So at this point, we have identified the attenuation controls. These are the resistors that form the attenuation control for the tone stack. Because when we go times infinite, the capacitors open up and then basically everything is disconnected at that point. And you go, well, if I limited myself to whether a capacitor was shorted or open, I couldn't analyze a tone stack, neither can you. So back to a uh, Thevenon's equivalent circuit, we need to look at something different. Again, the impedance. So, at a particular frequency, the impedance for the treble capacitor, which I'm going to refer to as ZCT, 
the base would be ZCB and the mid would be ZCM. Well, we're saying that at the frequency that is going to be passed by the treble filter, this becomes a path of least resistance. Our four axes, an infinite wall, are open, as do the other two capacitors. This is my high pass filter for the treble. And we get there because Z, the impedance of the treble capacitor, allows it to freely pass those frequencies. Now then, one thing to point out to you. In this particular wiring for the Fender Tone Stack, as shown here, when RTB goes to zero, when the bass goes to zero, and RMB goes to zero, this tone stack is shorted out, or the, or the attenuation out goes to zero. Doesn't make any difference what the volume control is, there's no signal in this particular tone stack. Now then, when we move on to the bass control, the same principles are applied. The frequencies passing through the capacitor for the bass control provide a signal path that has the least less resistance than, say, going through the treble path or the middle path. Again, when we break down a circuit for analysis, we're looking at extremes. There are going to be exceptions. What if it's a frequency that can pass both through the treble and the bass? Well, there may be a point where they both are equally attenuated and go through both paths. We don't have to worry about that. The math will work that out for us. The mid control, the other extreme, it gets down to this becomes a path of least resistance for ZCM, and those frequencies will pass through here again because current flows through the path of least resistance, and ZCT and ZCB acts basically in one extreme as opens or present enough impedance, which is so high, that it will not pass through there hardly at all. Now then, to summarize this up, this is what we get down to. For the treble frequencies, what's marked in red is that that path is ZCT, RT, RBB, RMB. That creates a path of least resistance for the treble frequencies. And then the blue shows the path for the base and the yellow shows the path for the mid. Now then, how do we label the fact that these are treble, these are base frequencies, or these are mid frequencies? Initially, we do not know and we don't care. It doesn't matter. The math will tell us what frequencies they are there. It is totally conceivable to change the values of the this capacitor, ZCB, and ZCM, swap them, swap the positions of the values of the base and mid, and actually have this being treble, the blue being mids, and the yellow being base. You don't know until you do the calculations and let the math tell you what frequencies exhibit the least amount of impedance for that path. Now then, stepping through the calculations, then it gets down to three basic steps. So in your spreadsheet, there's going to, you need to solve for each single order a filter, and there are five. There's three high pass ones. There's the treble, it only has a high pass. The mid and the bass have a high pass filter. Step two, uh, solve for the filters in series. There's only two of these. There's a low, high, mid series there's a low high base series filters. And then finally the third step is to combine each of those filter groups in parallel with one another. Pick two to start with. I would take the treble high pass filter and, and do the parallel calculations with the mid series. And then when you have that result, then combine in the base series with that previous resultant. It doesn't matter at this point which two you pick first because it's multiplication. A times B equals C, B times A equals C, doesn't matter. So a quick review. On a series calculation, again, as I pointed out in, in video one, this is the math that goes through in order to get a high, low pass with a high pass to give you either a band pass or a notch pass filter. And then for a parallel, 
This is the math we go through. Now then, the beautiful part about this is, and the reason we can get over our mental block is that for each of the, pa the passes, the treble, the bass, and the mid, there are frequencies that will pass through one, two, or all three, depending on the values of the RC circuit values. We don't need to worry about that because each of those pass will give it a particular attenuation and a particular phase angle. And this math resolves the phase angle and attenuation as a combination to send it out to the total combined uh, frequency response curve, which we get in a couple of slides I'll show you. Now then, this is something you need to know. It, this, when you have a tone stack or a filter that is, has a resistor as a termination load, if you were go back a couple slides, you would look at this and say, well, R and RB are in series, so I can calculate my series uh, value so I can get my, my current flow through the loop. All well and good. But a filter, which is terminated with a resistor, RV acts as a parallel resistor to R. This is an important bit of information I need to pass on to you. It is what happens. It's called a resistant, a resistive terminated filter. So here is the math down below. We just need to rem remember this as we go into the next two steps. One is the attenuation for the tone stack. Given what I just told you, RTA is in parallel with R4. RTA is in parallel with R4. If I were to show this as a short, this total stack would be in, in parallel here, but this being open, actually this bit, RTA, is going to act as parallel to R4. Now then, worked out the math, breadboarded it up, just to check my math. Always seems to be necessary to do that. But these are the basic equations. So in order to get the attenuation out of a node 1 with respect to node 2, we need to look at the ratio of RTA over, which is the wiper to the top of the stack versus the resistance of the wiper to the very bottom to the ground. That relationship is the gain for the stack. Therefore, without this consideration, when you do your tone stack filter uh, phase diagrams, you would see, or the, the gain versus frequency, they should start at a gain of zero and then vary from there. But because of this tone stack uh, control, generally it won't hit zero. It'll be something below that. Maybe 75% of the total value you could get out is it being attenuated right off the bat? Now this is what, so when the controls are are 50 percent or you adjust them, the best you're going to do is there's a certain value like minus 5 dB, maybe minus 3 dB. It won't be zero because it's attenuated. So let's go to the next slide. So that means without the attenuation, this orange curve here, this total frequency response curve, would start here at zero, drop down to minus 20 and then come back up to zero and go out again. But because now at midpoint on all the controls, this is where it starts, minus 10 dB, drops to almost minus 28 dB, and then rides back up again for these out, upper frequencies. Now then, I want to go through the software and show you uh, the Fender Tone Stack as I have it written and coded in my software. But I'm going to do that in the next video. At this point, this is all there is to the analysis for a Fender Tone Stack. All that's left really is to do the math as I've already described. I hope you find this useful. Thanks for watching.